Hey, Art Family! Artico is wrapping up its 2021 season with a look back at some of your favorite segments, like the best place for art and food in the DMV, a new and innovative museum that harnesses the power of the almighty word, and a tour that finally explains the funny-looking things on the roof of buildings, and much more in the DMV's best art show, Artico. Queens, New York native Shane Pomahambo is a longtime art lover and collector. Over the years, he discovered a passion for the lowbrow art movement coming out of California. After moving to our area, he opened the Art Wino Gallery in 2007, introducing the art form to the DMV. He also started Blind Wino, an arts club in Southwest DC. From there, his vision grew, and today he's the owner of one of the hottest spots in Northern Virginia. I think everything in life is all about a journey. So the first 10 years of Art Wino's life, the first three years was to establish my name as an art gallery. The second three years was doing events, you know, getting momentum and, and a following. And in the last four years, um, we did a lot of pop-up um, venues like Blind Wino, H Street, um, Austin, Texas, Miami, uh, and Richmond. And the idea was to kind of bring that to the people and. Um, so when I reached my 10 year anniversary, I said, you know, all right, so what do, how do I do my next 10 years? Like, what have I done in the past and how do I improve on it? And that's where Wino came in. So it's kind of the best of what I've done in the, in the last 10 years in one, one location, one, one house, if you will. This is the artist that's on display. That's um, Willis from LA. The art that we showcase here is, is um, you know, all encompassing. It's street art, it's muralist, illustrated, it's artist, um, you name it. So um, it's pretty much, I guess the best thing I call it is pop surrealist, because it's very much about pop culture. The art openings, uh, so we have six feature walls in the middle of the space. Those are our for the solo shows, or group shows. So um, those shows get completely replaced with a new show every month. And uh, it's all for sale. And the artists come out, so you get to meet the artists. Sometimes they do live sketches, sometimes they sell different merchandise as well. And this is Karatos from uh, Hong Kong. And it was really neat because she painted the, um, the inside as well. Oh, it was inside? Yeah. It's like a yin yang. Oh, okay. Isn't it neat? Yeah. Want to isolate people in you know, private rooms or you know, this area, that function. I want it to be all open plan so that it's very much a social place that people can kind of walk in and out of. So, the gallery, of course, is right in the middle of everything, so front and, uh, front and center. Um, we have a little retail component, which is really neat because in order to see those custom collectibles, you have to go to New York or California, so we're bringing that to the DC metro area, which is really neat. Um, we have three bars, so the uh, front bar is a tasting bar, and that's where you'll be able to try different um, spirits, beers, um, and wines. So this is Rodrigo Pradell from uh, Leesburg, Virginia. He immediately found me, we hit it off, and did a whole bunch of um, stuff together. My background is art gallery, so for me, I'm all about promoting the arts. And whenever I can get arts in front of people, it's, it's, it's magical. And so, um, the restaurant platform and the bar platform, um, I thought was a natural uh, progression to what I'm doing because I'm showcasing uh, different creatives. In this case, the chef with the beautiful art that he does, which the food and the, the craft cocktails, you know, it's all hand squeeze and it's all, they're all works of art. And so um, the idea is you bring the best of the best in one location and then they do what they do best. And so when people come, they see all the beautiful art and the ambiance, the art shows, the retail, and really good food and really good drinks. So um, they'll tell their friends, and, you know, keep coming. So we have monthly art shows. Um, we we uh, select different artists to come. Uh, from all over the world. In, um, in our space, we have four uh, murals. We have, um, they're from all over the world. So we have um, Karatos from Hong Kong. We have Woes from LA. Um, we have um, Dragon 76 from um, Brooklyn. And then we have a local artist 
Rodrigo. So that's really a neat way to kind of show West Coast, East Coast, international, and local, and how people do it differently. So business has been great since we opened. Um, people have come three or four times already, and they're telling all their friends, they're telling me it's their favorite new place. And um, I think a lot of people just love the vibe, you know, the energy of it. Um, because of the art. I mean, the art does all the work for it. For it so. Word is the world's first voice activated museum is located right here in DC. From the speaking willow tree to painting with words to a magical library. Welcome to Planet Word, where words and language come to life. Our founder, Ann Friedman, this is her brainchild. Uh, she created Planet Word out of her own love for words and language, and she wanted to bring that to everyone who visits the museum. Salam alaikum. My name is Mariam, and I am from Senegal. There are so many things to do um, and experience at Planet Word. Uh, the museum is on three levels, so the first level that you visit is all about language acquisition and how we acquire words, where do words come from. Um, one of the highlights on that floor is a 22-foot word wall that is interactive. It talks to you, you talk to it. Hey, I'm not doing all the talking here. See these mics? They're for you. Anytime you see this icon, it's your turn to talk. It's okay if you talk at the same time. Um, the second floor is all about the creative things that we do with words and language. So there is a very fun karaoke lounge where you learn songwriting techniques and you actually get to sing um, your favorite songs. Um, there's also a brilliant um, magical library where books come to life. There is a, a secret poetry nook where you can sit and relax and listen to poetry. There's also a humor gallery where you can have fun and tell jokes to your family member or friend um, and make each other laugh. Um, the tree behind me is the Speaking Willow and it was created by Raphael uh, Hemmer, a um, artist who does this kind of median, uh, medium. And you walk under the tree and you hear all these different languages, speeches, poems, uh, people talking, but in a variety of different languages. And as you move around the tree, the languages follow you um, and speak to you. So um, it's very, um, it's a wonderful addition to the museum. So language starts on the outside and continues as you go through. Um, well, I think people should always look on our website. We have wonderful programming. Um, we will hopefully start doing in-person programming, but all of it, um, for the most part, has been virtual. But we try to offer a variety of different programming for different age levels. Um, so that's something that, that we're really proud of, that we've been able to do. In addition to the exhibitions at Planet Word, we also have a wonderful museum shop, and the museum is free, so come check us out. The Planet Word Museum is open Thursday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. The Gargoyle and Grotesque Tour at the National Cathedral is a fun way to explore and experience this beautiful building in all its whimsy. And with volunteer docents like Andrew Martin as your guide, you'll get all the fabulous stories behind these quirky and marvelous carvings. You hear lots of stories about why we have these ugly, horrible carvings on the outside of our beautiful churches. The first story that most kids hear is that it's to scare the evil spirits away. But the real reason that we have these on our buildings is far more prosaic than that. It's to get the rain off. A gargoyle is a carved downspout. The word gargoyle comes from the same root word as gargle, or in Spanish, garganta. It means throat. So if it doesn't have a throat, if it doesn't have a pipe, it's not a gargoyle, it's a grotesque. Dean Sayer, one of the builders of the cathedral, knew something else about gargoyles. In addition to scaring evil spirits away, serving as downspouts, there's something else about gargoyles, and it's the reason you're watching today. Gargoyles are awesome. People love gargoyles. So Dean Sayer added gargoyles as a fundraising technique. 
Many of the, if not all of the gargoyles are sponsored by someone and they got to pick the design. They've depicted family pets, relatives, or just designs that they've picked. So many of the gargoyles around here have stories that come from the people who donated money to help build the cathedral. We do have some pop culture ones. Uh, some of the gargoyles were the res result of a design a gargoyle contest. Right above our heads is Darth Vader. So if you follow this buttress up. There were over 1,900 entries from around the world, and they picked the four best and actually carved those grotesques and added them to the towers of the cathedral. So the farther of these two gargoyles is described as a toothy duck. That's the one that has the bird on it right there. And you can see he's holding playing cards. You can see the suits of the playing cards underneath his wing there. So it's a rather fantastical design, but if you look closely in the duck's mouth where the bird just fluttered, you can see a tiny little cameraman peering out. The official name for this gargoyle is Candid Camera, and it represents and honors everyone who comes here to the cathedral to take pictures, all of the tourists and visitors. So if you are inspired by this show to come to the cathedral and visit for yourself, this will be your gargoyle. These are actually false gargoyles. They don't have pipes, but the, these are a pair that honor the two children of the donors who gave the money. So this is the little girl, and it was designed so that the pipe of the gargoyle would run out the mouth of her doll that she's playing with. You see that there's the mouth of the doll and there's the, the feet of the doll that she's playing with. And this one represents their son, and it's a little boy climbing a tree, and he appears to have just caught a fish and the mouth of the gargoyle, uh, the pipe would have run right out the mouth of the big fish that he's caught right there. I've been giving tours at the National Cathedral for over 10 years now, and every single time I come here, I spot something new. This huge schnozzed gargoyle is called the yuppie, but since our notion of what a yuppie is has kind of moved on, we usually refer to him as the businessman. The money for this gargoyle was given by a wife to depict her husband. And it's not the most flattering of depictions. He's got a really long hair because he was always so busy at the office making money that he never had time to get a haircut. He's got that enormous nose and his other hand, which you can't see. In one hand, he's holding the briefcase. In his other hand, which you can't see, he has a divining rod, which is shaped like a dollar sign, which he uses for sniffing out the almighty dollar. This is one of my favorite grotesques at the cathedral. This guy right here, chowing down on a drumstick. You can see his big old teeth. You can see his boogers there and everything. This is part of a matched set, and he's called Gluttony. And his mirror image is on the other side of this buttress. And opposite Gluttony is this guy with the hollowed, sunken cheeks. This is famine, starving to death. This is one of the most fun grotesques on the cathedral. This is official name is Toothsome, but most of the docents call him Chompers. This is another matched set of grotesques. We have old age on this side of the buttress. And on this side of the buttress, we have infancy, a little baby holding a rattle, having a temper tantrum. A lot of the grotesques reflect what was going on when this part of the cathedral was built. This was built in the 80s during Reagan. And this guy who's holding a bomb and whose hair is made out of bomb represents the fear of nuclear war. You can see that on the other side, his finger is on the button. Opposite the warmonger, cowering in fear behind a gas mask is the pacifist. So that's the duality of, of the warmonger and the pacifist. Behind me are two particularly fun gargoyles. On the left is an old nursery rhyme Tom, Tom, the Piper's son, stole a pig and away did run. He's a pig thief. He's riding his stolen pig, and he's got a goose that he's stolen, clutching it by the neck. On the other side, you can see that the farmer's guard dog has caught him and is clinging to his sleeve. Behind the pig thief is a cute little bunny rabbit that's being devoured by a boa constrictor. This gargoyle is a hippie. You can see he's got bare feet, he's got bell bottoms, He's got patched and torn clothing. He's got a protest sign. 
He's got a musical instrument. But of course you need one thing that's far more important than a musical instrument, a protest sign, long hair and torn clothing to be a hippie, and that is Dubich. So this bag right there contains the hippie's supply of primo weed. We have that directly from the artist himself. And that might be why the cathedral makers decided to put it away here in a corner where it can only be seen from a tiny little access stairway. I encourage you to check the website and book your gargoyle tour or your tower climbs. It's a truly magical experience. Doodle Hatch. Hmm, well, what might that be? Well, for sure, not just a cute and catchy phrase. Instead, a one-of-a-kind destination in Columbia, Maryland, created by artist and art clothing designer Lee Anderson. She's also the founder of the Manic Art Sculpture on the Human Form Competition and co-founder of the Fantasy World Festival. Doodle Hatch's mission is to inspire creativity and to support a clientele with unique fashion requirements. Doodle Hatch is a pretend department store for mythological creatures, time travelers, and galactic tourists. We, in, we created it uh, to allow all these creatures to have a place to shop when they were visiting the planet Earth. Now humans are very welcome. We do like them to come costumed so they blend with the rest of our customers. If you're meeting your space alien visitor, this is where you would meet them and then you would take them to the Galactic Telephone and Telegraph where you would phone home to let their mother know they had arrived safely. These are the 72 rules when you visit Doodle Hatch. It costs $5 for a human child. That's you, you don't all, you don't shape shift or turn into other animals. Not okay, that I this know is of. <laughs> this is good. It may happen later when you hit puberty. Um, it's $7 for human adults, it's $10 for unicorns, and $12 for dragons. Now, we love dragons, but we do charge them a little bit more because <clears throat> if they get a cough, <coughs> it can cause a fire. If you're a giant shopping for a cardigan, you can get them here at Doodle Hatch. This is Celeste wearing one of our giant cardigans. If you're a space alien and you've got your pajamas and you have four arms and four legs, we have those too. We have a bedding department, bed, bath and coffin. If you are a giant looking to shop for a lovely oversized bed, we have them available at Doodle Hatch. We also have cute books that you can read while you're testing the bed and having a little nap. And we have coffins all blinged out if you are a vampire and need a new bed yourself. These artworks were made by Meg Shap out of fashion magazines and plastic newspaper bags. She twisted the newspaper bags into tight little strings, made flowers, wild them and put a sparkly in the middle and then created that stunning artwork. These ones here were actually created by the fabulous Robert Reed. Lee studied art in New Zealand before moving to the U.S. 30 years ago. And although Doodle Hatch is her passion, something she does for the community, her actual day job is making clothes, including everything from $30 ready-to-wear to this $8,000 couture gown. Some of her clients have included the Queen of Spain, the Crown Prince of Thailand, and the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester. Our unicorns come in so that you can groom them, and paint their horns. You can also take a ride on them because they move on wheels. This is part of our housing department. Hobbits like to come here to buy a hobbit house. And in the meantime, little humans get to play in them. Wow, so tell me about this bridge. Well, this is a troll bridge. This is part of our housing department. Trolls can come here and shop for a house. Are there any trolls here now? Uh, not currently today, but they will Aww. be at Fantasywood Festival in May. And real troll will be under there trying to grab the children and eat them. Yeah, we love that. This is where the trolls come and make their troll house cookies. They like to use nice organic product and very famous recipes. They use organic ingredients like freshly peeled slugs and free range cockroaches. And they have some wonderful recipes like this maggot macadamia. This is the Dead and Breakfast Cafe. 
You can come here for some food, but it's not very filling, as you can see. When humans visit Doodle Hatch, we have a lot of activities going on. Everything is interactive here. But we also have special activities like painting and colouring and drawing and things that go on every day. And some days we also have extra activities like shrinky dink workshop, doing rock painting, or doing any other activities like theatre, dance and music. We also have a special activity going on now, which is just for adults. It does take about two hours of training time, but that's free. And you can create what we call a gallery glass window. It's going to be 88 feet long by seven feet high, and it will be along the side of the building. And this is a matching mural to the mural out the front, which is 140 foot long by eight foot high, that was created by 100 people earlier in 2020 and 21. So we are just all encompassing. We just want everybody who is into fantasy and creativity to come and join us and have fun. And we are just super open to any new ideas. The Archives Reggae Band was formed during a studio session back in 2012. Their sound is infused with everything from hip hop to jazz to go-go. And collectively, its band members have played with reggae royalty, like the Wailers and Black Uhuru. Instincts inspired Archives producer and founder Daryl Hunt to produce a reggae tribute album to the late Gil Scott Heron and his musical partner Brian Jackson. The first single, Home is Where the Hatred Is, features lead singer Puma Bata and was released on Heron's birthday April 1st and the album on the day of his passing May 27th. Gil Scott Heron was recently inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I told Brian about the project, I sent him some demos and he was blown away. And from there he said, man, I, you know, I'll be a part of it. So we flew him in and he recorded songs with us and here we are. I didn't expect it to be, to sound as great as it did. Like when we got in and we started recording, it's just like, it was just like magic. It's just, we did the music so fast. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was like, man, it was just kind of something just, I guess, really, you know, meant to happen. Because it didn't really take us time to build the songs all the, the parts and everything, the bass lines, like, it just came together beautifully. He definitely captured, you know, a root sound with this album that I, I personally really love. And even though we have a, a root sound to it, it's, we still threw in a different little elements of other things in it, which I think made it, just made it stand out. I mean, from, from the people, like the response from the people has been overwhelming. Like it's really doing really well in, especially in Europe. Okay, Rolling Stone magazine featured uh, elements of the album twice. The Billboard charts on the reggae charts, it got to like on number nine on Billboard. Gil Scott would be tickled pink, coming from the words of Brian Jackson. That he would he would love this. He would he would be so here for it. You know, and that that makes us smile. I mean the fact that um I mean Brian just gave us full endorsement, like on his Instagram page. Greetings everyone. I'm Brian Jackson. When the archives first asked me if I wanted to be involved in their tribute to the music of Gil Scott Heron and me, I was honored. But at the same time, wasn't exactly sure how an album of reggae versions of our songs would work. Let me put it this way. It worked. Better than I could have imagined. So much so that I'm proud to have worked on it and happy to say that this album carried me home is my favorite album of another artist doing our songs. And I, I love it because we put our heart and soul into it. You know, it was really a passion project. You know, beyond, you know, it's cool if it recoups and all that makes money, but it's really about just trying to do it properly and, and represent the music right. I'm not Jamaican, but I've been doing reggae so long. You know, I, I just, you know, I understand the music. So I have so much respect for, you know, Pierre's a born Kingstonian, you know, so I got that elements there. But for me, man, you know, reggae is just, when I finally understood what it was about, I said, okay, I get it. It's really a special music, you know, and I think it just needs a little more respect sometimes. It's amazing, like, how much it's influenced so much culture. Like, I was talking, we were talking about, like, with 80s music, and even, like, a lot of the big white groups in the 80s. So many elements 
of reggae. If you listen to like a lot of these groups, it was so many elements of reggae, from the police to Duran Duran. You know, all, Rolling all, Stone all. used to go to Jamaica to record with Peter Tosh. Yeah. Boy jo um, Culture Club, straight reggae, you know. It's always been a message of music, you know what I mean? It's always been that type of music that speaks about what's going on in everyday life. Gil and Brian's music really resonates with the youth and people today because of hip hop, the influence of hip hop. Like one of the main reasons that we chose to do Home Is Where The Hatred Is is because Common and Kanye West sampled it in the song. People are calling Gil like the father or godfather of rap or whatever, so people recognize, and a lot of it has to do with hip hop. Like his lyrics apply to like literally what was going, what's going on today. You know, so he, I think that's how young people can relate because if they listen to what he's, what he's saying, they can definitely see, you know, the parallel between what was going on then and what's going on now. Yeah, as Brian Jackson often says, to me, he was like, man, you know, when we wrote that music 30 something years ago, we were hoping it wouldn't be so relevant now. Carry Me Home was co-produced by Thievery Corporation's Eric Hilton. The group also collaborated with DC's own Raheem Devon on the project. To keep up with the band, visit archivesreggae.com. Well, that's it for us this year. We hope to see you healthy and happy in the new year. Stay warm, stay lovable, and stay true to your art.